Parliament House, New Delhi, 19th of August, 1985, the 35th year of our Republic. Fourteen founding fathers of the Indian Constitution called on the Speaker of the Lok Sabha, Mr. Balram Jhakar. The past 35 years have been the years of trial and tribulation. The Constitution framed by them has stood the test of time and become the bedrock of India's progress and unity. It is the embodiment of the hopes and aspirations of the people as a whole because it was the fulfillment of the people's striving for independence. The adoption of the Constitution of India was the culmination of a 90-year-long struggle for independence. For several years, the Congress had been demanding the right of the Indian people to frame their own constitution. In 1928, a committee was set up under the chairmanship of Motilal Nehru to lay down the principles of a constitution for India. The constitution recommended by the Nehru committee envisaged a federal system of government with residuary powers vested in the center and joint mixed voters for the Houses of Representatives and the Provincial Legislature. The 1929 Lahore Congress demanded Purna Swaraj, complete independence. In 1934, the Congress reiterated its demand for a constituent assembly to be elected on adult franchise for shaping the destiny of the Indian people. After the end of the Second World War, a cabinet mission was sent to negotiate the transfer of power to India. The 16th of May, 1946 statement of the cabinet mission announced framing of a future constitution for India by Indians themselves. Elections were held in July 1946, with Congress winning 199 seats. The Constituent Assembly met at Delhi on the 9th of December 1946. It was an impressive assembly of 207 eminent leaders and brilliant legal minds of the era. The Muslim League and a majority of the princely states abstained. Dr. Rajendra Prasad was elected as the permanent chairman. Welcoming the election, Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan said, Is the suffering servant of India, of the Congress, an incarnate spirit for which this country stands? Bulbule Hind, the nightingale of India, to address us. Not in prose, but in poetry. Mr. Chairman, the manner of your uh, calling me is not constitutional. It is poetic. <laughs> it reminds me of yes. some lines of a Kashmiri poet who said, Bul bul ko gul mubarak. Gul ko chaman mubarak. Rangin tabiya ko ko range sukhan mubarak. And today, we are steeped in the rainbow-colored tint of speech and speeches in praise of my great leader and comrade, Rajendra Prasad. Dr. Rajendra Prasad expressed the hope that the constitution framed by the assembly will be a model for all to follow. All that we need, all that we require is Honesty of purpose, firmness of determination, a desire to understand each other's viewpoint, a resolve that we shall do justice. On the 13th of December, 1946, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru moved the objective's resolution. Sir, I beg to move 
this constituent assembly declares its firm and solemn resolve to proclaim India as an independent sovereign republic and to draw up for her future governance a constitution wherein all power and authority of the sovereign independent India, its constituent parts and organs of government are derived from the people. Many eminent leaders participated in the debate. Sabhapati ji, Jo Prastav, Aapke Saamne, Mere Bhai Pandit Jawar Lal Nehru Ne Rakha Hai, Mai Uska Samarthan Karta. Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee. It is a solemn and a sacred trust which we Indians have agreed to perform to the best of our ability. Dr. Ambedkar. Our difficulty is how to make the heterogeneous mess that we have today take a decision in common and march in a cooperative way on that road which is bound to lead us to unity. On the 22nd of January, 1947, the objectives resolution was approved. The Constituent Assembly elected members of the advisory committee and formed 13 committees and subcommittees to look after the various aspects of constitution making. On the 2nd of June, 1947, the partition of India was accepted by the Congress and the Muslim League. Deliberation of the Constituent Assembly continued on the basis of the Objectives Resolution. Many designs were received for the flag of independent India. On the 22nd of July, 1947, Jawaharlal Nehru moved the resolution on the national flag. that the national flag of India shall be a horizontal tricolor of wheat, saffron, kesari, light and dark green in equal proportion. In the center of the white band, there shall be a wheel in navy blue to represent the charpa. On the 14th of August, 1947, the President of the Assembly, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, proposed that the Constituent Assembly of India has assumed powers for the governance of India and that the Constituent Assembly of India had endorsed the recommendation that Lord Mountbatten be the Governor General of India from 15th of August, 1947. The proposals were accepted by the Assembly. On the night of 14th and 15th of August, 1947, Jawaharlal Nehru moved the resolution on India's independence. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny, and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge, not wholly or in full measure, but very substantially. A drafting committee for scrutinizing the draft constitution was appointed on the 29th of August, 1947. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar was its chairman, and Alladi Krishnaswami Iyer, Gopala Swami Iyengar, K. M. Munshi, Sayyid Muhammad Sadullah, Sir B. L. Mittal, and D. P. Khaitan were the other members. Before preparing the draft, constitutions of various countries were consulted. France, Ireland, Italy, Canada, United States of America, Soviet Union, Australia, Japan, and several others. On the 4th of November, 1948, Dr. Ambedkar introduced the draft constitution in the assembly. Each article of the Constitution was discussed threadbare and amended to meet the demands of the majority. The 
four members from Jammu and Kashmir, headed by the Prime Minister, Sheikh Abdullah, joined the Constituent Assembly in June 1949. It was proposed that a preamble should spell out the aims and objectives of the Constitution. Many suggestions were received. Mr. Subarao from Vijayawada wrote, a new aim called prosperity may be included with a Sanskrit verse. May the children beget their children and their children beget grandchildren. Let the poor be rich. The preamble spelt out the aspirations, rights and responsibilities of the citizens of India. We, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign democratic republic and to secure to all its citizens justice, social, economic and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship, equality of status and of opportunity, and to promote among them all fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation. Article 1 of the draft constitution was taken up on the 15th of November, 1948. The members proposed an amendment for changing the name India to Bharat. The article was amended to read, India, that is Bharat, shall be a union of states. The Constitution lays down the qualifications for citizenship of India. At the commencement of this Constitution, every person who is a domicile in the territory of India and who was born in the territory of India or either of whose parents was born in the territory of India shall be a citizen of India. Fundamental rights were framed with utmost care many suggestions were received about the need to safeguard individual liberties and rights of the minorities from Sri Rajagopalachari, Rajkumari Amrit Kaur, Dr. Ambedkar and other eminent personalities. Hansa Mehta. It will warm the heart of many a woman, sir, to know that free India will mean not only equality of status, but equality of opportunity. The Constitution guarantees the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the laws within the territory of India. The state shall not discriminate against any citizen on grounds only of religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth or any of them. Untouchability is abolished and its practice in any form is forbidden. Cultural and educational rights of the minorities are safeguarded. Article 19, 1 says that all citizens shall have the right to freedom of speech and expression to assemble peacefully and without arms, to form associations or unions, to move freely throughout the territory of India, to reside and settle in any part of the territory of India, and to practice any profession or to carry on any occupation, trade or business. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of India Mr. P. N. Bhagwati said, The Supreme Court is at the apex of this system. The Supreme Court is the guardian of the fundamental rights, and even the right to move the Supreme Court for enforcement of fundamental rights has itself been declared to be a fundamental right. Article 39 of the Constitution lays down that the state shall, in particular, direct its policy towards securing that the citizens, men and women equally, have the right to an adequate means of livelihood. 
that the health and strength of workers, men and women, and the tender age of children are not abused, and that citizens are not forced by economic necessity to enter avocations unsuited to their age or strength, that childhood and youth are protected against exploitation and against moral and material abandonment. Many members argued that there were inherent contradictions within the fundamental rights and directive principles of the state policy. Mr. Justice P. N. Bhagwati explained. The directive principles of state policy set out the kind of socio-economic structure which the constitution makers wanted us to build in this country. India opted for a parliamentary system of government wherein representatives of the people are elected on the basis of adult franchise. There shall be a parliament for the union, which shall consist of the president and two houses, to be known respectively as the Council of State and House of the People, the Rajya Sabha and the Lok Sabha. Elections to the House people, the Lok Sabha, and the legislative assemblies of the state shall be on the basis of adult suffrage. That is to say, every person who is a citizen of India and who is not less than 21 years of age on the date of the election shall be entitled to vote at the election. Special provisions have been made for reservation of elected seats in the parliament and state legislative assemblies for minorities like scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and Anglo-Indian. There shall be a president of India. The executive power of the union shall be vested in the president. He is elected by members of the electoral college, consisting of members of both houses of parliament and the legislative assemblies of the state. The president invites the leader of the majority party in parliament to hold the office of prime minister and on the recommendations of the Prime Minister, other ministers are appointed. The powers of the Union and the state governments were clearly defined. The Indian Constitution contains 395 articles and 9 schedules. The Constitution is so framed that sovereignty is vested in the people. In other words, the Parliament draws its powers from the people of India. The constitution is not rigid and does not bind down future generations. It is flexible and can be amended by a two-thirds majority to meet the aspirations of succeeding generations. After the third reading, the constitution was approved and signed by all the members. On the 26th of November, 1949, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, the President of the Assembly, put his signature and seal to the Constitution. In recognition of his service to the nation, Dr. Rajendra Prasad was elected the first President of the Republic of India. Sub-Rule 1 of Rule 8 of the President of India Election Rules, I hereby declare the Honorable Dr. Rajendra Prasad to be duly 